stand with me and let's begin to worship the Lord in song this morning. We thank you that you're with us at every second of the time and that you love us with all of your heart. We pray that we will love you with all of our hearts too and one another. Please receive our praise today and our worship because we mean it from the bottom of our heart. And we pray and we praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me again? Let's continue to worship the Lord in song. <laughs> Thank you. 
help us to be humble before your throne and to hear your voice and to respond to it in it alone. Not our own thoughts, not the things that hold on us from this world, but only what you desire for our lives and for our church. And Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13 and elsewhere this morning, so if you'll turn there, please. I don't know if you ever think about it, uh, why is it that we have preaching? You know, some churches have rituals. Why do we have preaching? And then I wonder uh, if you thought ever, it would sure have been better to have, to have lived with Jesus and to listen to him preach and give us God's word directly. But if you think about it, there is more in this book that we can learn about God than the apostles learned three and a half years with Jesus. That seems incredible, but this also is God's word. And Jesus was the living word of God, but Jesus is the author of this. And so there is a sense in which it's better for us to have this than to have Jesus personally with us, though, of course, he's, he's in our heart. Anyway, that thought struck me as, as Brother Scott was talking uh, about these things earlier. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, we're going to talk about angels again. Fantasy movies often give people the power to protect themselves with deflector shields or force fields, as they used to be called. And in these deflector shields, Missiles and spaceships and weapons can, can threaten, but they usually cannot penetrate those force fields. Every once in a while they do, though, because something goes on that, that's amiss. But normally you're pretty safe, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about The Incredibles or Star Wars or Star Trek. Every, every one of these fantasy movies has uh, these shields in place, and those are fantasies. They're not real. I did read this weekend that someone thinks that they can develop one. We'll see about that, okay? Maybe they will. But we do already have a force field. We have a celestial force field right now with us and everywhere we go if you are a Christian because angels are everywhere. And God has dispatched angels to protect us and to guide us and to help us everywhere we go. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 says this, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Let's talk about angels. Now angels masquerade as human beings, and so you might not recognize them when they come by. They operate in the background. Now, this does not mean that angels are hiding. They're not hiding from us. What it means is that, uh, well, they don't want their presence necessarily known. Now, they're not spying on you. So it's not like angels are looking to see how you're doing and they're going to report to God. That's unnecessary, of course, because God sees everything anyway. They're not reporting to God. It means that angels are found in unexpected places. And angels are primarily interested in you, not themselves. Angels' identity is not important to them or to you. Angels do not call attention to themselves unless it is absolutely necessary, unless it validates the message. One day an angel appeared to Zechariah in the temple, uh, the father of John the Baptist, and he said, you're going to be deaf and dumb for a certain amount of time. And he announced his name to validate what it was that he was saying. His name was Gabriel, by the way. 
Gabriel also appeared by name to Daniel several times in order to validate the message so that Daniel wasn't thinking, well, this is just some kind of a weird dream, but this is actually from God. To an angel, serving is the important thing. They don't want recognition. They don't even want your thanks. They definitely don't want your worship. They want only to meet your needs and to do God's will. <clears throat> the Hebrew writer in chapter 13, verse 2, probably is referencing the book of Genesis. If you turn there in Genesis chapter 18, because here is a man who entertained angels. His name is Abraham. Genesis chapter 18 and verses 2 and 5, uh, they operate incognito. So he lifted his eyes and looked, this is Abraham, verse 2, and behold, three men were standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. You see what's going on here? Abraham looks up and there's three guys. They're right there, okay? But he's not thinking this is unusual. He's thinking they just got there and he wasn't paying attention. So verse 3, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Now he's not thinking this is God when he uses the word Lord. If he was thinking it was God, it would be in all capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. He's just referring to these people as his, uh, well, superior. Verse 4. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So here are three angels that have appeared to Abraham. Abraham doesn't see them as angels. He sees them as three travelers. And he offers them the traditional ancient hospitality. He offers to wash their feet. He offers to give them something to eat. He offers to give them something to drink. To do anything other than that would be a, a, a great insult on social ethics. So Abraham did these things, but he did not know that they were angels. They are visiting him, and we read in verse 22, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. One of them was the Lord. But he didn't know that either until now. Now, these angels were on a mission from God. It was a twofold mission. First of all, they were to stop by Abraham and tell Sarah, his wife, that she was going to have a child in the spring. And the second thing that they were going to do was they were going to go to Sodom and burn it to the ground, which we mentioned last week. And they did do that. So they were serving God in a positive way, and they were serving God as far as humans are concerned, in a negative way. Abraham did not recognize the angels because they looked like ordinary men. They weren't glowing. They didn't have wings. They just looked like regular people traveling, and he offered them regular hospitality. They did not fly in, though they did appear, and they did not get on their wings and fly out. They were just like regular people. So Abraham served God's servants, and God's servants served Abraham, he actually entertained angels, as Hebrews 13, verse 2 says. And I suppose that's easy for us to understand because this is Abraham. I mean, he's the father of our faith. He is the father of Israel. And, and we understand that, that Mary was a great person and the, the angel would appear to her. Of course, she's a great saint. And, and Daniel, come on, the guys in the lion's den and all that kind of stuff. And, and Daniel was a great saint of God. And you would expect God to dispatch angels for these very special saints. But what about us? Well, we're important to God, too. And angels are important to us, too. And we have angels everywhere around us. So God's angels also minister to regular people like all of us are. They minister to God's people and they serve with great power. How much power? Well, the power is partly in their number. Do you remember when Jesus was um, in the garden of Gethsemane and the, the guards came to arrest Jesus? A whole multitude of gods. And if you turn to Matthew chapter 26, we're going to read a verse in a minute. And all these guards show up, the temple guards, by the way, they weren't Roman guards, they were temple guards. 
and they came to arrest Jesus and, and, and Peter pulls out one measly little sword and he's going to attack all of them. <laughs> one sword is all they had. And Jesus said to him, well, let's look at what Jesus said to him in Matthew 26 and verse 52. Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Now, a legion is a, is a group of soldiers in the Roman army. And they, depending on what time period and depending on which general you're talking to, I suppose, the, the number could go anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 soldiers in one legion. So I've chosen the low, the low number of 5,000, and I did a little calculation, checked it, and double-checked it, and triple-checked it, because if I don't, it's going to be wrong. <laughs> That's, uh, let me look at my number, 60,000 angels. Jesus said, listen, you got one sword. I could call up 60,000 angels to defend me if I need to. Now that 60,000 angels that are not busy somewhere else, that 60,000 angels that are not fighting demons somewhere else, that 60,000 angels that are not acting as guardian angels for someone else, they're ready to strike down this multitude that have come to arrest Jesus. All he has to do is ask the Father and it will happen. 60,000 angels. And it could be 100,000 depending on what the word legion actually means. But really it's more than that, okay? Jesus is using this word as just a, just, just, well, just as a way to, to, to say it, but look in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, because this is going to tell us how many angels there are. You want to know how many angels there are? They are in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of of angels. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. We don't know what it means. The word is myriad. And the word myriad was used in the Greek language to refer to a number that could not be counted because it was more than could be expressed by numbers. Okay? So it just means more than we could ever fathom. More than we could ever fathom. That's, how, that's why it's translated in English to an innumerable amount of angels. There are a new, innumerable amount. Now, there's a innumerable, innumerable amount of humans, right? We got 7 billion right now, right? And people that know these things say there's been about 6 billion before us. So whatever that is, okay? That's how many humans there have been. And, but there's more. We can count that. <laughs> but you can't count how many angels there are. Innumerable. And God, before he ever created one person, said, I'm going to need at least one angel per person. And so he created all those angels before he created anybody else so that we would have enough angels. And, and we're just talking about the good angels. He created at least one good angel for every person. So their power is in their number. But their power is also in their strength. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, I do want you to turn there for a minute too. We find Elisha and his friend. Elijah and his friend are, are having a difficult time <laughs> because the king doesn't like Elisha. And so he has sent an army of soldiers to capture one guy, Elisha. And so they're out there on the field, Elisha and his friend, and his friend is like shivering in his sandals. <laughs> and this is what, Elijah pulls back the curtain of earth so that we can see heaven. So in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 15, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what should we do? So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he looks at Elisha and looks at himself and he says, two? <laughs> two? <laughs> and Elisha prayed 
and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young men, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Angels. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Angels everywhere. Angels with power. John also gives us a glimpse of their strength in Revelation chapter 20. Now, we, we assume that Satan is the most powerful of all angels. And that's probably true. Okay? It's probably true, but it's not always going to be true, and it's not always true. Because Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2 says that one angel will take down Satan. And we're not even given his name. Revelation 20, let's start with verse, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. One angel takes down the devil. The devil has been commanding thousands and thousands of demons for years. The, the devil fought with Michael the, Michael the archangel, and it was hard for Michael to overcome him. But one angel is going to take Satan and throw him into that pit and lock him and chain him down. How is that possible? Because the power is not really in the angel. The power is in the Lord. The Lord gives the amount of power that he wants to specific angels, and he's let Satan have the power that he has. But any time the Lord wants to take it away, he can take it away. So that means that one angel can be as powerful as God wants him to be. And 100,000 angels can be as weak as God wants them to be because God is the one who gives them their strength. Angels serve you, and they serve you from birth to death. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10 tells us that they begin to serve us when we are born. So why don't you turn there for a minute, because there's a, there's a big passage I want to read there, besides the one verse. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10. We're talking about guardian angels. They are real. You know, a little picture of the, of the angel and the little girl at the bridge that you've seen before? It's real. It's real. Verse 10, take heed, Jesus says, that you do not despise one of these little ones. And he's talking about a child. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. What? Their angels always see the face of the father who is in heaven. It is because the angels live in a dual sphere. They live on earth, but they also live in heaven. Now, you ask me to explain that. I can't explain that to you. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's beyond the laws of physics, and I don't understand those very well. <laughs> but it's a spiritual thing. Angels for children are always in their presence. But those angels also are also in the presence of the Lord. Every child is given a guardian angel at birth, and this angel watches that child. Now, how much protection can they give? You know, as well as I know, that some very horrible things happen to some children. How is it possible that the angels that are their guardians don't protect them 100%? Well, you know that some horrible things happen to you, and you are God's people. It is, it is a mystery how evil can sometimes encroach and cause all kinds of problems. But think about the varieties of evil and the powers of evil that are present with us even now in this building, by the way. There are demons. And don't think there aren't demons in this room, okay? But God's presence is better. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, okay? And there's angels all around us. And there are wicked people. I'm not saying there are wicked people in this room, okay? But there are wicked people in the world, and there are wicked laws that are made. And there are wicked justices that are out there. 
And there are wicked politicians that are out there. And the world is full of wickedness. And this wickedness sometimes breaks through the force field of those angels and causes horrible, horrible pain. And I don't understand all of it. I don't understand any of it. I just know that it's true. And I know that God is doing what God can do by giving us guardian angels. The guardian angels care for children up to the age of accountability. Now, I don't mean to scare you, but that's why it's very important to be saved at a young age. Because once you reach the age of accountability, there's no guarantee that you've got an angel watching over you. But there is a guarantee that you have an angel watching over you from birth to death as long as you have become a Christian. Now, let's look at this passage because I, I need to establish this, this whole thought here in, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to them and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So Jesus acknowledges in verse 6 that children can be harmed though they have guardian angels. Verse 7, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed than having two hands and two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Guardians care for children. Guardians care for children and adults once they are saved. Guardians serve us during our lifetime. Here's where I'm going to make that point that we all have guardian angels, okay? In 1 Kings chapter 19, which we're not going to turn to, but you can write down and look at it later. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 8, we have a hungry prophet. Jezebel, who is the wicked, wicked queen in Israel, is chasing after Elijah. She wants to kill him. She has sworn to her God, Baal, that I will kill you when I catch you. And he's running, and he's tired. And he sits down, and an angel appears to him and gives him bread and gives him a jar of water. And Elijah eats that bread and drinks that water, and he is good for 40 days. He didn't have to eat for 40 more days because the angel took care of him at this time. So Elijah shows us that, that God has an angel that takes care of our physical needs. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying. I guess he's on a rock like the picture. <laughs> he's praying. He says, God, I know that if I redeem human beings, I've got to die. And it looks like I'm going to have to die on a cross. And it's not going to be pleasant. And God, it was bad enough coming to earth, leaving heaven. It's bad enough having to eat this bad food down here <laughs> and wear these shabby clothes and to stink. But I, thought, I don't want to die. I don't, want to, I don't even want to leave this. And I sure don't want to die on the cross. God, if it's possible... If it's possible, take this cup away from me. And he struggles with God's will as you would, as we all would. As we always do. Sometimes we always do. Sometimes we always do. <laughs> and 
And the Bible says, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Luke twenty-two forty-three. 43. Well, Jesus did die on the cross. Jesus ascended into heaven and he sits on a throne of glory enjoying all the pleasures of heaven. Meanwhile, his people are out preaching the gospel, just doing what he says. And Peter's out preaching the gospel and, and, the, and the Jewish authorities don't like it because they're going to lose their place in the temple. And so they arrest him and put him in prison and lock the door. And an angel walks up and he goes, and the door opens up and he says, Peter, hey, get back to work. And Peter leaves the prison and Peter returns to his sermon. How would you like that if I was arrested and I came back and, and would you wait for me? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but they waited for Peter. That's in Acts chapter 5. But in Acts chapter 12, Herod, the secular king, arrests Peter. Well, the governor, Herod, arrests Peter and puts him in prison. Only he wants to make sure that Peter's going to stay there. So he takes a soldier and he chains him to the soldier. And he takes another soldier and he chains him to the other soldier. And he puts him in the prison and he locks the door and he puts a soldier outside the door to guard him. And an angel just comes in and goes, poof. And the door opens up and the chains fall off his arms and Peter leaves the prison because the angel was there to serve Peter. Now by these things and other things in the scriptures, we conclude that angels are with us all the time. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 22, we see that angels are there when we die. You can turn there, that's a good verse. Luke chapter 16 and verse 22. It's only one verse, but still it's a verse. Luke chapter 16 is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You probably know that by me telling you chapter 16. Lazarus is the beggar, and it says in verse 22, so it was that the beggar died. Notice the contrast here. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by who? the angels to Abraham's bosom which is just an idiom to say that he went to heaven the rich man also died and what happened to him he's buried see the contrast the angels are there when you die to carry you to heaven the angels are not though there with those who are lost they're just buried and then they they meet their fate later on So from this, we infer that all believers get the same regal treatment at death. Angels are absolutely amazing. But you want to know something? You want to know a secret? It's not a secret. Maybe a secret to some. Angels think you are amazing too. Isn't that amazing? I think so. They marvel over your relationship with God and wish they had it. They wonder at God's salvation. Think about it. Angels had been around for who knows how long, maybe billions of years, until God created man. And at one time, angels had a test to obey God or not to obey God, and, and one-third of them, 30% of the angels, followed Satan, and the other two-thirds stayed with God. And what did God do? He turned them into demons or let them turn themselves into demons, but he did not offer a, an opportunity for them to be saved. But when God created Adam and Eve, and they sinned, he offered to save them. Isn't that amazing? God offered to save us. Amen. We sinned too. And God sent his only son to die for us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, which we're not going to read, but you can look it up later. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12 says that the angels stand in heaven amazed that God would do this for you. For you. Wouldn't do it for an angel. Do it for you. Angels wonder at God's decision to use the church to spread the gospel church to spread the gospel. 
He chose 12 men and said, okay, guys, well, one of you's out, okay? <laughs> one of you is Judas. You're out. We're only going to have 11 now. He chose 11 men and said, I want you to, sp to spread the gospel. 11 people. 11 people who were not rich. Well, one of them was rich. John was rich. Who were not seminarians, who were not professional clergy, who were not professional speakers. So I want you guys to go out there and I want you to spread the gospel. <laughs> he trusted 11 men and they did it. And look what we have now in the church of God. It's all over the world. That's just amazing. But not only that. He looked down in Texarkana and got feedback. <laughs> and he said, you know, I think we need a church in Texarkana. I think we need it on this location. And I'm going to entrust it to just a handful of people from various backgrounds some work with their hands, some work with their minds. Some work well with people, some don't work with well, well with people. But just a group of about 100 people, which, by the way, is the average size church in America today, 100 or less, in attendance, not in one role. And I'm going to trust the gospel to these people. And you know what's happened? Hundreds, maybe thousands of people have been saved through the ministry of Central Baptist Church. Some of them in the building, some of them in your homes, some of them are going out to be missionaries, some of them are going out to be pastors, and, 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 and we get credit for all that too. Because God said, I'm just going to do that. And the angels go, I cannot believe that. <laughs> I cannot believe that he's trusting the gospel to people. Look at the way people act. They kill each other. They steal from each other. They lie to each other. They don't trust each other. And yet God did it and continues to do it because he's God and he loves us so very much. Maybe more than the angels. The church has not always done so well, you know. During the Middle Ages, the visible church was torturing people, killing people, just for believing something different. And today, good night today, you got preachers that are running around with their secretaries. We got people that are, we got church members that are stealing money, not in this church. Church members that are stealing money out of the offering plate. We got all kinds of crime and pedophiles and, and all kinds of horrible things in churches. But we still have churches. And we still have good churches. Because God is entrusted. And the angels go, I don't, why would you know? choose somebody better, God, than ordinary people? Well, God has worked a miracle. The gospel, 2,000 years later, has endured all of this abuse and it's still alive. And the angels wonder, Ephesians verse, chapter 3, verse 10, at the manifold wisdom of God. <laughs> Finally, the angels wonder at our worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 10. There's a lot of strange things about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10 that I'm not going to explain to you, and I don't know if I could. But as part of it, I want you to see. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. What? This is the part I want you to see. Because of angels. Paul is telling the Corinthians, you guys need to straighten up. Because they were a rowdy group of people. <laughs> he says, you guys need to straighten up because there are angels everywhere. And they are among you. So the women, whatever that means, should have a symbol of authority on their head because of the angels. I don't know where they are, but they're in this room. There are angels in this room. And they are watching us. 
Are they watching us so they can report to God? No, they're not watching us to report to God. They're thinking, I cannot believe these people are doing it. I cannot believe, God, you're accepting this. <laughs> Look at that preacher. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. <laughs> Half the time. And they're watching us. And they're praising God for you. And they're going to be here during our business meeting. And they're going to watch us. And they're going to say, God, I can't believe that these people are able to come up with, with, with this kind of a, a, an agreement. As many different opinions as they have. As many different perspectives as they have. And they're going to come through it. And they come through it in harmony. And they love each other anyway. How can you do this, God? They're going to marvel. They marvel over our business meetings. They marvel over our, our worship. They marvel over our activities. They marvel when you go out and visit somebody because they say, well, you know, they're tired. Why wouldn't they stay home and rest? God, what have you done with these people? It is because of what God has done with these people. Luke chapter 15, the final verse I want to read to you says that angels rejoice when the kingdom grows. You know what happens when somebody gets saved? Here's what happens. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over when a hundred sinners repent. That's not what it says. One sinner repents. You've never seen a party. <laughs> you have never seen a group of people get excited. Then when you get to heaven and you watch how the angels respond when one person gets saved. One person gets saved. Because they know what it means. Because they've been in heaven. They know who God is. They've seen him face to face. Shouting party. Angels are on your side. Even if you're not saved, they're on your side. They're, they're rooting for you. They want you to be saved. They want you to be in heaven. And they are glad when you get there. Angels are everywhere. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit Salvation, Amen. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. Thank God for angels. Because there's no telling <laughs> what kind of shape we'd be in if it wasn't for their ministry. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how great you are to help us in these ways. And, and it's a mystery to us too. Why you would make angels servants of us when you could do it all yourself. But this is how you've chosen to do it. And we're thankful for angels. And we're thankful for you. And we're thankful that they are here with us watching this invitation amazed at what you've done in the life of every one of these people here. Father, it would be a good day for the angels of God if they could witness salvation today. Someone being saved, someone giving their life to Christ. It would be a great day for us too. And so, Father, we pray that you will do that today. Now, before you stand, I want you to keep your heads bowed and I want you to pray for one another. I want you to pray for that one person here today that has never given their life to Christ. And if you are that one person that has never given your life to Christ, you don't know if your sins are forgiven. You don't know if you'll go to heaven or you'll go to hell. You don't know. Let me tell you how you can make it certain. It's very simple. You don't have to promise to give any money. You don't have to promise to be good. All you have to do is say, God, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I don't understand it. I just know that's what the Bible says. I believe. I know. Good night, I'm a sinner. I am always doing something wrong. 
Please forgive my sins. I don't know how to be right. Please make me right with you. Help me to do the right thing. Come into my life and change me. If you will pray that prayer, I promise you, on the basis of God's word, you will be saved. And when you die, you will go to heaven and an angel will carry you there personally in the presence of God. So if you're ready to make that commitment, all you have to do is pray that prayer. I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that. And then we're going to stand and we're going to sing and we're going to have an invitation. And if you want to talk to me, since we're in the pews, come see me after the service and we'll talk. If you want to talk to Brother Scott, Brother Scott would be happy to talk to you. Okay, let's stand. Brother Scott, let's, let's have an invitational song. Oh